told just this day. The solitary one who could not find his place amongst us, bent by wrath and grief o'er the loss of what was dear to him. It consumed him and led only to death, both for him and many innocent folk. A tragedy which struck a mournful chord it rang across the fruited plains and through the amber fields of grain that was in his America. America, which lashed out against the east with this dreadful sin, feeding on the flames that once burned so bright, yet still the wound will not heal. So I stand before you now to sue for peace and hope. Throw away your hate, and now remember, extinguish the fires of September. Yes. So, 
it's a story that I've heard told in a lot of different ways. I'd, I'd love to just hear it in your own words. What, what do you think the kind of Homeric or to my ear even Virgilian kind of material? Well, I think. This, really tell me that story. Well, I think I wanted to. I wanted to make it a noble story, at least in terms of the second half of the poem. I used Homeric ep epithets to describe the different um, groups of first responders that came because I wanted to immortalize them in a truly Homeric, which I feel is, you know, it, it immortalizes them in a way. I, I wanted them, you know, to, to receive their due, which, you know, which they so rightly deserve. Um, and I think it, it just, it elevates it to a scale that I think that an event like this should be elevated to. It's something that should be remembered and told, and not not forgotten and told forever. And something that people should, you know, people should hopefully see the best of themselves in these first responders and know that they too can save people's lives if they want to. And that's I feel the real essence of Homer and Virgil is seeing characters. Um, reading about and seeing, hearing about characters that you can identify with, or at least parts of them. And I hope that we can all identify with these first responders and these, and these people that were in danger and sort of understand that, that struggle that they went through and incorporate that into our own lives and not take things for granted or you know, stop and help somebody when they need help. It's about, it's about getting that courage and that confidence to do what you need to do or what you feel is right to do because those people did and so can we. And so that's, I hope it was didactic in that sense. And I hope that the American Vir Virgilian aspect out of that too. Zach. I was, I was wondering if there were any interesting or unorthodox sources that you used for research, primarily in the first half of the poem. Um, I used a book, one book primarily that was written by a journalist, I believe Terry McDermott. It was sort of, he interviewed a lot of people that had that had encountered Muhammad Atta. Um, and so I was really able to gain a lot from his work and his journalistic um, um, skills. I think yeah, that, that was inherently um, essential to my work. And also, in the second half of the work, I relied, I relied a lot on the New York Times oral histories that they um, brought together from, a, from everybody who had been affected by September 11th. Um, the one individual that you guys heard me mentioning repeatedly, Bruno Dellinger, uh, was um, just a, an individual who worked at um, worked in the tower in the North Tower, and he um, his uh, sort of a recording of his experience is um, survives on the uh, on the 9/11 memorial website. So that's how I was able to ask. I was listening. I listened to him talk about what he uh, what he went through, and I incorporated a lot of what he said into it. I, there was one part where I talked about the beautiful fall day is marred. He remarked the first thing he said was that it was a beautiful. About the so a lot of things, um, you know, were, were like taken directly from what I heard people talk about, and some of the metaphors. I had a lot of metaphors that I didn't end up using, but some of them were just directly what people said, like the wind rushing slowly. Like that's that's actually what first responders said after they got out of it, and that's I wanted the, their words are the are the best words to describe it. So and I also um, went on an online database to get the three um, eulogies that I compiled his project 2,900. 96, I'm going to say, of all the people that perished on that day. There is a, it's an online initiative that is trying to eulogize every single person that died. And they have eulogies written by individuals who maybe they didn't know the person, but they got information about that person and decided to write a eulogy about them. And, um, and so that's how I was able to find stuff about um, those people specifically. So that's a little bit about it. I also read um, the 9-11 Commission report sort of to get the specifics about how everything went down and the details about how in the first part when I was saying what time it was, that was all from the 9-11 Commission report and also some from the journal book. But a lot of my character sketch of Muhammad came from the journal's, uh, journal's book. Yes? What did you want to accomplish in your portrayal of Muhammad uh, It was, uh, I struggled with how to portray him for a very long time because his acts were horrendous and awful and unspeakable. And that's, that is one side of this man, this person who killed so many people in such an awful way. However, 
He was not born an evil man. He was born just like everybody else in this room. And so I wanted to do a little bit of digging and find out why he decided to do what he did. That's sort of what I said at the end of my introduction. I'll tell you about why he convinced himself to do it. Um, and it was really fascinating for me to read about it, just to read about issues that he suffered that you know, a lot of us suffer. Unemployment, dissatisfa dissatisfaction with your government, things like that. But obviously, he took it incredibly out of proportion. But it's it's these common, it's it's a common thing. And I think there's one quote I heard earlier this year, which I had I had the privilege of participating in a program in conjunction with the Vassar Jewish Union and the Vassar Islamic Society called Avi Schaefer Shabbat. And there was a quote that. Um, we found it was by the boy's father who was killed in a car accident, but he was very active in the Israeli and Palestinian conflict and trying to resolve that. And the quote was, an enemy, who's, uh, an enemy is someone whose story you haven't heard. And so I was hoping to tell his story today so that people would understand a little bit more about him. I'm, it's a lifetime struggle to work through how you feel about people who do acts like these. But I think that Especially, I think I just I just don't think that hate is the answer. I think we should try to work towards some understanding, and that's kind of why I wanted to look at him. Obviously, part of me hates him. Part of me understands him. Part of me doesn't know what to do with him. It's it's a constant it's a constant struggle. But I could say it was very it was enlightening to learn more about this person and to compare try to compare some of his life to my own and try to understand him because I think that. That's what we're all trying to do in college, is to learn and understand it in life. So that's what I, that's what I was trying to do, to help people understand. Yes? Do you have any plans for carrying this project forward? Like, is it um, I would, I, I'd like to keep working on it, making it better, because it can definitely get better. <laughs> um, and uh, and um, I don't know. I, I'd like to keep writing poetry like this, especially about causes that are as worthy and events that are as worthy of remembering as September 11th. And I think that it's really important. One of the reasons I wanted to do this was I wanted to, I was struggling with trying to find a way to make my degree, the degree that I will be receiving all too soon, um, uh, in Greek and Roman studies, to make it relevant and to do something good with it and to do something that I feel can help people. And this is something that I stumbled upon something that I love, that I loved writing this. And I think that, I hope I can do a good service for people by saying this and reminding people about this event. And so I hope I can continue with it because, you know, it's, it's really important to me. So I think I'll keep working on this poem or writing other ones or always, you know, you know, always, always keeping with it. So thanks for asking. Yeah, Kate. Okay, I'm really curious about your, um, yeah, well, it was, yeah, it was another, it was a long struggle. When I originally heard Dr. Mitchell's performance, he did it in a way I envisioned to be perfect. I said, this is how it should be done. You know, this is, he had it all memorized. He, you know, sort of used his own sort of language in a way, just like Homer did. He just, he spoke it all from there. No notes. Bam, it was amazing. And I said, I want to do that. And then I said, I don't know if I can do that. It's, I don't have that much time. And it's, and it's so, it's so difficult. And so it, it, it went from a struggle of being, I want to do exactly what he's doing to, I, I guess I need to do my own thing. And, and that's sort of how the process evolved. Um, in terms of just making making this genre my own, or you know, to try to try to do, you know, try to do what I what I wanted to do. So um, I wanted some I wanted to open with a hymn because there are Homeric hymns, and you know, there's an instance in the Odyssey where the bard um, sings a Homeric hymn about the love of Aphrodite and Ares um, before he talks about the Trojan War. So I I wanted to I wanted to do that for my poem, um, and I wanted to dedicate it to the bards of the to pay homage to 